Welcome into episode 317 of the Skate Podcast. I am Brian DeFelice, joined by Bridget Prue and Scott McLaughlin. Bridget and Scott, the Bruins fall to the Florida Panthers 3-2. to two. They are down in the series 3-1. to one. They dropped both games in Boston. They had a 2 nothing game, uh, 2 nothing lead in the game. Obviously, a lot unfolds uh, after that. Florida wins 3-2. to two. Opening shifts, let's go right to you guys. Yeah, well, we got to start where... You know, the play that's just impossible to ignore, and that is Sam Bennett's game-tying goal in the third period, where I think most people see that and think he got away with a cross-check on Charlie Coyle that knocked Coyle into Swayman, or at the very least, a a shove, you know, called a cross-check or a shove, whatever you want, but forced Coyle into Swayman and then buries the loose puck there in the crease. Uh, Bruins challenge, which... The Bruins' record on challenges is very good. They, they don't challenge just out of wishful thinking. Uh, you can't really afford to because if you miss, you get a penalty. So you give the team uh, the, the opposing team a power play. Um, they felt confident about it, that it was going to come back, which, you know, I didn't fully know the rule. Like, I was trying to look it up as they were challenging. it. You know, as the rule is written, the Rule 69 in the NHL rule book says – nice. Thank you. Uh, says that, you know, if the if an attacking player forces a defending player into the goalie and prevents him from making a save, it's still goalie interference. So it doesn't matter that Bennett technically interfered with Coyle instead of Swayman. It's all still goalie interference. At least that's how the rule's written. It goes to the review in the NHL Situation Room in Toronto. Obviously, they see it differently because the goal stands. Um, and you know, yeah, but there's a lot to break down there. There's a post game reaction to get into from, Mm -hmm. from all sides. You know, Jim Montgomery explained why they decided to challenge David Pasternak, Jeremy Sam and Charlie Coyle were were all pretty, you know, pretty blunt about the fact that they thought there was clearly interference and were surprised by the call. Um, so there's, a lot to get into, but you know, my take is just that I I think the NHL straight up blew this one. I think I think they just flat out got it wrong. Yeah, I went to bed and I was like, you know, we all saw it. Like, by the way, these are the kind of things that, like, if I was the broadcaster, I would and the refs come out and they they give this ruling. It would probably have gone against everything I would have been saying during the review because I'm as somebody who knows the rule and it's this this is the rule. In the NHL, this is the rule in college. This is this is just the rule. You can't just throw someone onto the goalie and be like, "Oops, your problem." Like that's not that's not the rule. And and the crazy thing is, Scott, when they gave the explanation, um, which it went out to uh, certain media members, it, it's not they didn't explain it live um, in the game. They gave the explanation not that not that Bennett didn't do anything wrong. The explanation was that Jeremy Swayman could have made a move. It didn't prohibit him from making a move towards the puck uh, to, to try to make a save, which makes it even more ridiculous because at, you can't even argue that part of it. Like you can't argue that he could have done anything to, to make a play on the puck there. So uh, that's the part that makes me the most like confused and angry about what the NHL is even thinking and doing. And, and the explanation makes it worse. But anyway, um, my, my whole thing is we're talking about, after and, and going into the game, this, this, Sam Bennett was already part of the storylines, right? Like it was going into game two and uh, and these two games in Boston, it was the series is going to be scrutinized and we're going to, you know, keep a close eye on it. Well, I think you're taking a look at the wrong thing. Like you're worried about the wrong thing if you think that it's the players that are the ones that are causing the issue. Because I think the way that game two was ref officiated with all the ejections, like it wouldn't have gotten to that point if they had handled it correctly. Marshawn getting punched in the face uh, and and multiple angles, new angles that we saw yesterday, but that the league definitely had earlier, showed pretty clearly Bennett punching him in the face. Um, no supplemental discipline. That's a league problem. Uh, and, and then in this game, completely blowing the game-tying goal that it would have been if the Bruins had held on to that lead. They would have tied the series 2-2, and this thing goes on at least six games. And it's better for the – like, it's better for everyone 
to not have us talking about this today. Like, why is it that we have to be talking? Like, we could be talking about, okay, the Bruins only got a few shots on goal in the first period. No, that's not what we're talking about because this completely just ruined – it um, may have ruined the whole series. And I'm just thinking to myself, like, you're clearly worried about the wrong thing if you're the NHL and you're thinking the players got to gonna calm it down and, and keep it cool. Like, you're the one ruining these games. Uh, and it's happened multiple times in this series. And it's just so frustrating because we all love the sport. We all love watching the NHL. Obviously, that's why we do what we do. But it's days like this where, like I told you guys before I got on, I was mad when I went to bed. Uh, I woke up even angrier because it just – it makes it not fun anymore when this kind of stuff happens. So, look, I understand everybody's frustration, and rightfully so. Uh, to your guys' point, it's it's never fun to see a situation where a call is the focal point, right? But all, there's – it's 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 too easy for us to sit here and and look at that call in a vacuum. I mean, even even the the penalty call on Lindholm that led to the Bennett power play goal, soft call, yeah. But you know what, man, when the when the Panthers are on the power play, the puck doesn't leave the offensive zone. Them scoring is pretty much inevitable, and too much happens over the course of sixty minutes to look at one play. Uh, the Bruins first goal that they gave up the Bruins third goal that they gave up. And so I just want to kind of go back a little bit to why I think the series is, is where it is right now, because yes, Bridget, you're right. It's a blown call by the letter of the law, according to the NHL rule book. Okay. The, the, The rule says what it says. And if Bennett doesn't score that goal, maybe the Bruins find a way to win the game and tie the series two, two, and it's totally different. I still think ultimately cream rises to the top and, my issue with the with this series is is it's not the refs, it's the Bruins. It's the Bruins. It's 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 a continuation of them getting outpossessed, outplayed. Um, I know they had good moments in this game. I get it, but I just think the Bruins, they, for whatever reason, whether it's coaching, whether it's the fact that the Florida has too many horses than the Bruins. Like the Bruins have a lot of ponies, a lot of horses, right? I get it. Maybe that's, it's all accumulating to the reason why the Bruins are getting outplayed, but this series is not being lost because of the refs. It's being, it's being lost because Florida's a better team and they're they're out executing the Bruins. And just to kind of give a quick synopsis, three or four games, because we can kind of reset midway through the series, right? Goals, 10 for the Bruins, 16 for the Panthers shots per game. 19.75 19.75 for the Bruins, 36.5 for the Panthers. Faceoffs, 118 for the Bruins, 133 for the Panthers. The Bruins are actually out hitting Florida, 205 to 201. But as Scott mentions in the past, oftentimes that's because one team has the puck a lot more than the other. And with that in mind, it actually tells you a lot that Florida almost has as many hits as the Bruins when they have the puck most. <laughs> um, Power play is a big one. Power play percentage through the first four games. Bruins, 6.25%. Florida, 25%. I mean, that's what I look at, guys. I I know the Bennett call is frustrating. I get it. It comes on the heels of the Marshand incident the game before. I understand. But it's so far beyond that that I just can't look at the one call and get too focused on it because, yes, it changes things, but there's too much in the Bruins' control that they are not doing properly. Yeah, I mean, listen, the the Panthers are a better team. And I think we all thought that going in, and that's certainly been, you know, that certainly is how this series has played out. They have dominated possession, shot attempts, everything. They have more high-end talent. They're deeper. You know, if you want to say goaltending is the one advantage Bruins have, okay, that can be an equalizer to an extent. Like that's all true, and and I picked the Panthers to win the series in six. And even if the Bruins had held on last night, I still would have thought the Panthers were the favorite to win the series. But I, I can't just brush aside the the officiating. Like it's it, that's a one goal game last night. I mean, we saw you know the game after Vancouver beats Edmonton in a game they got outshot forty four to eighteen. Like it. It happens. You can steal those games in the playoffs. And Swayman played well enough that the Bruins could have done that. Like, yeah, there's a lot of other things to point to. Bruins had three breakaways in the second period. Couldn't bury them. After Barkov scores the go-ahead goal with 12-plus minutes left in the game, Bruins had zero shots on goal the rest of the game. 
Zero while trying to come back in a one goal game. Unacceptable. All, all of it. But so is the officiating. Officiating extremely unacceptable. It's just yet yeah, you mentioned not just Lindholm's interference on, on Ekman Larson, which puts the Panthers on that power play in the first place, which soft call. If you want to say it's interference, fine. It's also absolutely embellishment by Ekman Larson. He flops to the ice. Five seconds after that, Sam Bennett trips Charlie Coyle behind the play. Coyle's skating past him, and Bennett sticks out his stick and trips him. No interference, no trip, missed. So at the very least, like there should have been evened up penalties there. Okay, there's not. They blew that. So then you go to the power play, and I just don't know how, like, how it's, like Bennett cross-checks Coyle into Swayman. It's a penalty by Bennett. It's goalie interference. It goes to review. The league has a chance to get it right and somehow blows it. And Bridget, like you mentioned their their explanation, the statement they put out through um, through their Twitter account and to the NHL media site. I just want to read it in full because it, it's just a flat out lie. Video review supported the referee's call on the ice that the shove by Florida Sam Bennett on Charlie Coyle. So first off, they admit there's a shove. And the subsequent contact with Jeremy Swayman did not prevent Swayman from playing his position in the crease prior to Bennett's goal. Like, do they think we're idiots? We all have the video. Like, what are we talking about? He is clearly prevented from playing his position. And no, Scott, he's just gonna deadlift that guy. Like, he's gonna he's gonna like squat him. He's gonna get up. He's gonna be able to lift coil with his body and move over to me. Like, what? Yeah, and, and the, the the Bennett punch is its own whole thing we can get into. Like personally, I, th- I think he should have been suspended. If the NHL had all the angles that we've now seen, like let's state this clearly: it's a sucker punch that knocks out a captain and star player with a, con- a concussion. We, we're pretty sure it's a concussion. Like, and there's nothing: zero penalty minutes, zero game suspended, zero dollars fined. Like. What do you do? Do you care about head injuries or not? It, I mean, it's, I can, it's, I can, all of it's so baffling to me. That's that's what I'm saying. Like your priorities are in all the wrong places, and in we've see you see it here and there, but like it just this series is just shows you all like the levels of incompetence or um, you know priorities just not being what they should be. And I just I don't know how. And we've talked about this before. Like, how do you fix it? Do you need to hire better people? Do you need to explain it better? Like, there's no care taken in in these situations, clearly. So it's really frustrating. And another thing that that I was fired up about when I woke up this morning, uh, once again, got a great night's sleep, still woke up in this mood, but uh, was some of the comments after the game because you we talked to Jim Montgomery. We go in the Bruins locker room. We talk to the Bruins. Th- these are the people that were on the on the frustrating end that should be the ones that are a little bit angry or, you know, they all answer everything very calmly. Um, they never question the officiating. They just say, you know, they they see it like that. That's, you know, that's not, no, not everybody sees it the same way, whatever. They kind of dance around it, give some political answers. Um, Montgomery didn't go at him at all. And then which he, he should have, by the way, which I, he should have. I do want to get into talk this. about and, that too. Yeah. So he, so he doesn't say anything. I was thinking he might go Tortorella, but what actually the, the, the part of all of the post game stuff that made me angry last night was how the Bruins handle it that way. And then Paul Maurice comes to do his press conference and he's just a complete ass. <laughs> like I, I've never seen. It was an easy answer for him, right? He could have just been like, yeah, the refs got it right. Or like, you know what I mean? Like just super easy, simple, quick, dismiss it. Instead, he attacks reporters for even asking a question. I'm sorry, if someone's going to ask you about the most controversial thing that happened in the game, uh, it's it's our job. It's anybody's job. And and and, any, and the player, the fans want to know the answer too. So he comes, he attacks Greg Wyshynski, pretends he doesn't know who he is when he's one of the lead NHL reporters, you know, in in the league. He's uh, he accuses him of being a, a bias towards Boston. Uh, and then uh, Greg corrects him and says, no, I'm from Brooklyn. Um, but it just, 
why, why is that how you're talking to people? I've worked with a lot of coaches and seen a lot of interviews and, and press conferences. I've never been treated like that. And I've never seen any coach treat someone like that. So, um, you know, the Florida media will probably, cause they're a little feisty themselves, uh, will probably be like, Oh, you're, you know, you're getting upset over nothing, but, uh, it just, you, it shouldn't be handled that way. He looked, he made himself look bad to uh, at least this fan base. And, and he could have just taken the high road, but he decided to go as far down on the low road as he could. And if, if you're wondering what I'm talking about, there's some, just the, the post game press conference for Paul Maurice. It's, I think it's right in the beginning uh, that he has this back and forth. Yeah. Greg, Greg Wyshynski also tweeted out like just specifically the exchange between him and Paul Maurice. So people can go to add Wyshynski if they want. Um, but yeah, he, he's, he's very condescending and he treats reporters like we're all idiots. And listen, I know there's fans where there's a lot of fans where that plays very well because there's a lot of fans who hate media. Bill Belichick did it for year for yeah, but like, decades here in New England, and a lot of Patriots fans loved it. Um, so, no, but but I've been to some of those press conferences before too, and this just felt like Belichick kind of just more dismissive. This felt like incredibly condescending. Like I know Belichick did that at some points too, but this this was a uh, it was almost like a conspiracy. Like he was very conspiratorial, if that's a word. Yeah. About and it's, like it's been... accusing, accusing. He made it about the the people asking the questions rather than about the game or anything. Like I don't know. Yeah, and he's talking about like their their foreheads in the front row, furrowed yeah. brows, and like he, he's done this multiple press conferences now over this weekend. Like he he said media blew up the Sam Bennett thing into you know it should have been a non story and the media just made it a big story. And, you know, he's asked about, do you see a punch? And he's like, no. And I, I don't think any of you would either. And it's like, do you still feel that way, Paul? Like, have, have you seen the other replays? Because it's very clear. And yeah, I mean, for me, like, I always approach it this way with any interview subject or like anyone we talk to as, as media. Respect is a two-way street and I'm always going to give people respect until they give me a reason not to. Paul Maurice clearly doesn't respect us and that the way he treats us, I don't respect him. And like, that's all it is. You know, fortunately I don't cover the Florida Panthers, so I don't have to deal with him every day. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's, and you know what, in, in hockey, they're very few and far between. You're going to run into that kind of uh, person because overwhelmingly respectful people in the, in the hockey world. Um, and that's, you know, college pros, I just, I, I haven't, I, I haven't seen it. And then it, it's just frustrating. It's like, you don't talk to people like that. Yeah. I mean, uh, John Tortorella, I've seen some pretty heated exchanges with him in the past. That probably is more so than maybe the Paul Maurice stuff in a different way. I mean, uh, I mean, he's told even, people to go fuck themselves. Even that, like, I almost appreciate torts in like, like at least like he's more combative. Like he'll go back and forth. But like he's like he, he's just looking for like an argument. Paul Maurice is, is different. Like it's a different tone. It's that real condescending, like, I know what I'm talking about and you don't. Whereas like Torch is like, oh yeah, that's, that's what you think. Well, here's what I think. Like I I, I don't love Torts. I'm not a huge fan of him, but like I at least have a little bit more respect for that, like the more combative approach than than it's, condescending. I will say it's funnier. It's yeah, it's more him. entertaining. Like it's like, and he like he completely loses his his cool sometimes. Which, uh, that's Paul Maurice is like a controlled, contrived condescension. <laughs> so you guys, you, you guys just have to you know you have to understand it's just it's it's all part of the gamesmanship of of what of what's going on. Like he's you know he sits up there and I I don't know what it is you all think you're seeing but it's just a guy playing the hard right way. Like it, he, look, it's you're, you're, you guys are kind of okay. buying right. You're buying right into it a little bit. I, I, don't, I don't think he's think putting that much effort and energy into being disrespectful or condescending. I think it's just, it's part of the, it's, an, it's another day at the office for him. How long has he been in the yeah, city? It's part of his personality, years? I guess. I yeah. don't know. I mean, and, and uh, also, but you know what? It's not smart. It's not smart. So you can say whatever you want and you're, you're working the refs and you're, you're working the NHL or whatever, but guess what? Guess who writes about you? And guess who, you know, when they're well, trying he, to find their, he's, like, 
Yeah, but I mean, he's fortunate he's that he's there. in Florida, where there's literally like two reporters on the beach. Guys, he's so. trying. He's not. He's not concerned. With all due respect, and and I hear what you guys are saying, but he's not. He's not concerned with what people in the media room think. He he he's concerned with what the league hears in this press conference. He's trying to placate to the league because the, everybody's bashing Florida, and he's trying. He's tr- it's all gamesmanship for him. That's just the reality of the situation. I understand the frustration, but. I mean, I think, you can placate yeah. the league by saying they got it right rather than by asking, like yeah. saying someone's dumb for asking the question. Yeah, sure. Definitely. I mean, there's definitely, he's definitely condescending. He's, he, there is that. Um, but look, again, I, I just, I don't want to lose track of, of what's going on between the boards too, because outside, outside of these controversial calls and, and, and the frustration there's there, there's just way, there's way too much happening to break down that I just don't I don't want to let the Bruins off the hook too too much because again um the, you come home and, and 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 again my question is why were you flat in game three okay like end of game two it's a, it's a one one series your star player goes out there squares off at center ice you're coming back to Boston you got the entire crowd on you and again. You're on your heels the whole time. When I watch this Bruins team versus the Panthers in particular, when the puck drops and it's 0-0, it feels like the Bruins are already down a goal or two. And when the Bruins take a lead in the game, it feels like it's 0-0. And I think I feel that way because so much of the action is down Boston's end and they're not their scoring chances are few and far between. So again, you take a two-nothing lead last night. I know the Bennett stuff happens. I get it. I know. But Ultimately, you drop two games at home, and it's not like the Bruins were out playing them and just found ways to lose. It was what what is what is going on that allows Florida to just implement their game? Is it coaching? Again, yes, Florida has more talent, but it's so far beyond that. Like all these guys are professional hockey players; they're elite at what they do. It's why they are where they are. The discrepancy shouldn't be too too much it really shouldn't be but yet florida plays a style where they're on their toes boston plays a style where you know they're looking for the perfect shot they want quality shots over quantity and guys the playoffs is not the time to be selective with your shot shot making it you you have to play on your toes the four check seems passive they're waiting for florida to make mistakes remember when sheldon keith after the maple leaf series says teams just wait for the for the mate for the toronto maple leafs to make mistakes that's not going to happen with the Panthers. You can't trap them into anything. You have to go out there and make things happen. I feel like when the Bruins are on the ice, they're spending way too much time thinking and not enough time doing. Well, you, you can force the Panthers into mistakes, and the Bruins have done it in stretches in the series. Like The Panthers will give up odd man rushes because they are such a pressing team. Like if you can, If you can take the puck from them and quickly turn up ice, you can get on in rushes. The Bruins did it in game one. They got three breakaways in the second period of game of Sunday's game, game four. They didn't capitalize. You know, if you just bury one of those to extend your lead to three, nothing, we're probably having a different conversation. We're probably not worried about Sam Bennett's pop goal there. Like, so even with the Bruins getting so badly outshot and outpossessed, there's still mistakes that you, you can take advantage of. There's still space that you can get on this Panthers team that it, they just didn't take advantage of it. Um, yeah, it, you know, the, the shot selection thing, like I, I feel like this has definitely become a storyline and something that, you know, Montgomery is going to come under criticism for because they've been quality over quantity all season. That was by design. And, I get it, and I actually will even push back on the idea of, like, playoffs isn't the time for it because in past years in the playoffs, one of the Bruins' problems has been that they haven't gotten enough high-quality shots. They haven't gotten inside enough. I mean, there were teams under Bruce Cassidy that put up 32, 34 shots a game and scored one or two goals. And it was, and the, the criticism was always like, oh, yeah, well, they just throw the puck on from everywhere, and but they're not dangerous. So – there's a balance there, but I think the Bruins this season under Montgomery have swung too far the other way. Like we've seen them score on plays where they just throw a shot on Brandon Carlo last night. Exactly. His, his goal is just throwing the puck on net Trent Frederick against Toronto. Like 
that the shot that beats Samson off. So there needs to be a better balance. And I think it's it's telling when Montgomery gets asked about that and he talks about, well, we need more possession. We need to hold on to more pucks to get more of the chances we want. And then you talk to players and Carlo, McAvoy, whoever says, well, there's no such thing as a bad shot in the playoffs. And it's like, feels like two different messages. Like feels like the the players aren't totally buying into the idea that they should be holding for better shots and, and not just throwing pucks well, on. And, it, and it's not, it's not, it's not that black and white either. Right. Like it's not, it's not either. It's not quality or quantity. Like you said, Scott, that in, the, in past years, the Bruins would settle for a lot of perimeter shots. And so their shot total would tick up. Okay. Understood. But that's not, I mean, Florida is averaging 36 shots a game. I think a lot of those are also quality too. So it's not, it's not like if you're, if you're getting quantity, it's only quantity. You you can do quantity and quality at the same time. It's not one or the other. And I think that I think just having, yeah, you mentioned it, like having an inside presence on the ice. Like, like I just, the four check to me is a problem. The four check is way, it's way too easy for the Panthers to, to break out of the zone. It's way too easy. I don't know if the Bruins forwards are, are, are making the wrong reads. They're going to the wrong side. Of, Florida gets the puck behind the net. The Bruins will go to the one side of the net. They just break out the other side. Like where, where, where's, where's F two? Where's F three? You know what I mean? Like it, it's, it's, too, it's way too. They're giving them way too much time and space. And then on the other side of the ice, the Bruins aren't taking the ice that, that that's given to them. They're forcing passes where Florida's reading it. They're reading. They're the Panthers are able to read where the where the next pass is going. So how do you combat that? Okay, take the ice that's given to you, and then maybe you'll draw somebody out of coverage, and then somebody opens up. Or you get the, it's not this whole quality versus quantity. It's 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 not it's not one or the other. And I think the Panthers are a perfect example of they're getting quantity, they're also getting quality. Yeah, and uh, like you said, the best example recently of sometimes the the long range, lesser quality shot goes in was Carlo who looked surprised that that one went in uh, at first. Like he was like, Oh, it's in. Um, but I mean, you know that it has a chance to go in. You're thinking you're probably shooting more for a rebound or, or just, you know, sending in the long shot, but uh, it ends up working in that case. It ends up working, you know, enough times that if you, if you do it enough times, it, it you increase your chances of, of, having one of those go in and uh, I agree with you, Brian, it's like you can find those quality chances. And I understand like when you're shooting it, depending on where the rebound goes or it getting blocked, like you, you have a chance of losing possession rather than keeping the possession, waiting, holding, being patient. But there was a time at the end of uh, in the third period of game four where the Bruins were doing that. They were and they were looking for the perfect zone entry. There was a delayed penalty. They were looking for the perfect zone entry. They probably wasted about forty seconds off the clock when they were losing, um, and and the the crowd was getting very antsy. Like, what the hell? Like, you just either go in the zone or give them like just start the power play. You don't have a lot of time to be messing around with here. And then as soon as the Bruins get done with the power play and and spend time, you know, not getting any chances on net, you, the the fans are chanting, shoot the puck. <laughs> and, he, and I don't mean like, hey, you know how every time someone has a puck, people just yell shoot. Like, no, it was like a an actual chant, like let's go Bruins, but it was shoot the puck. And it was because it's frustrating to watch at times when you are trying to be too selective and you're losing in a game and you're losing in a series and you just got to generate offense. Yeah, I, Brian, you you mentioned the the four check, and it got, I was thinking about this like how many times did the Bruins turn the puck over at the offensive blue line in Game Four? But like, forget not getting in on the four check and taking the wrong angle. Like, did they were having dumpings just knocked down at the line? Like they they weren't even getting it past the defenseman at times, and it's almost like it's almost like indecision on whether they're trying to carry it into the zone or set up a four check. And, and another part of that is they're spending so much time in their own zone that by the time they can get the pug out and, and go dump it into four check, two or three guys have to go out, offer a change. So you're not even able to set up 
your normal F1, F2 um, angles going in. Like it's, so it, it's, it's obviously all tied together. Like the, they're not killing plays quick enough in the defensive zone. So they're not able to get out on the rush with any sort of energy. And then they don't, they can't execute their four checking plan. They can't set up. Like it, it's, it's been a mess The five on five, you know, outside of the, what's the, I'm trying to, I was just thinking like, what's five on five goals now in the series, like five on five goals, still fairly close. It's eight, seven Panthers for the series, but possession wise and everything else, like Bruins are just getting worked. Yeah. And, and you know, the Bruins are a perfect example right now, especially with no Brad Marchand. Okay. Charlie McAvoy is a defenseman. Okay. Unless you're Kale McCarr or Quinn Hughes, no defense was really a, a game in and game out offensive threat. Okay. But so you're pretty much left with David Pashnak as a game in game out elite scoring threat, which by the way, you know, unless you're Connor McDavid, you kind of need help around you to also um, be that, be that, that effective. Cause you can't, you really can't do it yourself. Although you can try this Bruins team. It's, it, it's a long way of me saying they are the epitome of what a lunch pail blue collar game plan should be. The Bruins should be with this roster. The Bruins should be trying to play a grinder game instead of a skill game. And for whatever reason, they're still trying to make plays. That's another thing that Jim Montgomery has implemented, Scott. he They focus on shot quality over shot quantity. He's also put an emphasis on making plays over the offensive blue line. And that's great. Maybe in the regular season, that stuff works. It doesn't work in the playoffs, especially when you don't have uh, the talent. That, that other teams possess. The other seven teams in the playoffs that are, are remaining all have a lot more elite talent than the Bruins do right now on their rosters. Yes, certain players can make those plays, but even if even if we were talking about the Oilers with McDavid and Drysaddle, I would still be saying the same thing. Like get get the pucks in and go after it. Now McDavid's probably the one exception in the world. Him and McKinnon, where the puck on their stick probably gets to the corner faster than the puck being dumped in. But you you know what I'm trying to say. Like again, no amount of of skill should should eclipse um, playing the right way in the postseason. And so, yeah, like just Trent Frederick, Brazo, Geeky, JVR, go up and down the lineup. Coil, like Zach, these guys, they just have to get it in and go after it. And they should be going too hard on the puck, and then have F three supporting. Or if the D wants to jump in, have F3, you know, supporting the defense. And if he wants to pinch, like, just keep it simple. And, and they're not, they're overthinking the game instead of playing it. And I think that's the problem. Sometimes you teams can fall guilty to being overcoached, especially when things aren't going your way. You try to rectify what's going on and you try to game plan so much that players are thinking too much when they're out there instead of going on their instincts. Sometimes teams are better off, especially when you're playing desperate just go out there and trust their instincts and attack the game and play like there's nothing to lose. Because right now, this this is the one good thing about this situation is the Bruins know for being on the other side of a 3-1 series last year against Florida and this year against the, uh, the Maple Leafs. If you can just steal game five, plant that seed of doubt into Florida, come back to Boston and try to win one for game six and anything can happen in game seven. So this series isn't over, but they have to start playing on their instincts, they have to start playing desperate and simple. I saw I saw someone tweeted, uh, someone I'm friends with tweeted, the Bruins have a chance to do something hilarious. Uh, because, and meaning uh, the Panthers are now the ones leading the series three to one. Um, and meaning, could they possibly reverse the roles from last season and come back and somehow win three straight, take the series? Um, it feels like, a really tough task. I mean, the Bruins just lost three in a row. Um, they won the first game. It's been, but it's, it's been a while. Um, do I think they could win next game? Yes. It's just really, it, it's going to be hard for all the reasons Brian just mentioned uh, for them to come win three straight against this team and, uh, and, and try to try to make it to the next round. I, I don't think it's impossible. Obviously, t- uh, teams have done it before. Florida did it to Boston last year. It just feels like a 2-2 series. If if the Bruins had been able to win uh, game four, 
is so different than than a 3-1 series in this case because uh, you needed to steal a win one way or another in game four in order to really feel like you had a, a decent chance. But um, I don't know. I don't know what Vegas has the odds at <laughs> at this point. Uh, if you were betting on Boston to win the series, what what kind of uh, numbers you're looking at? Like what percent chance is is that even going to happen? Uh, yeah. What what would you say they have to do in order to somehow rattle off three wins? I mean, Jeremy Swayman plays unbelievable and stops 42 or 43. Like that, I mean, that's the honest answer. Like uh, all the problems that, that Brian's laid out of, of just how overmatched the Bruins seem, all the numbers we've gone through five on five. Like, I don't think you're turning that around from one game no. to the next in series that there's, because the, the problem is like, I, I do think the Bruins have wanted to play simpler hockey. Like, in, in their locker room, they've and they've got on shirts too. Three words: physical, above, behind. Play physical, play above pucks, play in behind the defense. Like that's been their motto for the playoffs. Like that's how they want to play, and that is like the simplest way of playing. The problem is, is you're going up against the Florida Panthers team that also plays that way, that does it better, and that has more talent. Like. It, it's it's just it's the worst possible matchup. If you're facing a more skilled team, maybe you'd have a chance of grinding it out, like like you did against Toronto for much of that series. Um, if you're going up against another physical team that was on roughly equal footing talent wise, yeah, you can grind that out. That becomes a 50-50 series. The Panthers are just the worst of both worlds. Like they're yeah. they're they're the team that plays that style the best, and they're more talented. Yeah. So so to that point. It, this Florida Panthers team to me is the makeup of a team that will never relinquish a three, one series lead. They, I, they're, they're too deep. They're too talented. More importantly, they work too hard to lose three games in a row to a inferior opponent. In my opinion, that said, since you never know and crazy things can happen, this is how the Bruins would win this series in a miracle fashion. Swayman, yes, if the Bruins go to him, hell, they might go to Omar in game in game five to try to change things up and make, see if he can get hot for a couple games. But they need a hot goalie, number one. Number two, they need the benefit of some calls. That means power play opportunities, maybe a <laughs> maybe a goal that shouldn't count that does. But again, to, to get power plays, you got to move your feet and you have to possess the puck for the most part. Uh, you can't rely on uh, drawing penalties in your own zone. Um, and, and the last thing is you're going to have to have the Panthers choke. Anytime a team's up three games to one, if a team wins that was down three to one, they're not winning that series unless the other team shoots themselves in the foot, which the Bruins did last year uh, many times. When, when the Bruins were in a situation last year up three to one, Marshan could have ended it on a breakaway at the end of the regulation in game five. And then all Mark and Grizzly gave the puck right to Kachuk. So that was game five, Then, it, but then it snowballs, right? So you're going to hear all the cliches from both dressing rooms the next couple of days or until game, game five. Florida is going to be sitting there saying the fourth game is the toughest to win. We know that. We know they're going to come out desperate. They're going to come out hungry. It's, it, it's very tough to end another team season. That's what they're going to say. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. The Bruins are going to say, yeah, we got a ton of belief in this room. Just gonna take things one game at a time. You know, we can't look ahead to game six. So to take care of game five and 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 we'll go from there. And then it's like if you win game five, you go back to Boston for game six. Well, guess what? Anytime there's a game six, somebody's up three to two. So there's ways to look at things in a vacuum for the Bruins, but it's gonna have to be because the Bruins gets the benefit of some calls and the Florida's have to shoot themselves in the foot. That's what it's gonna come down to. So and then if if Florida feels the pressure. Look, we've watched the Bruins be favorites for decades here. If you are the favorite and you're and you're never supposed to lose a series and things start to go against you, how do you respond? So if Florida can feel some pressure again and the Bruins can capitalize, but they have to go out there and make it happen. Yeah, and, and Brian, you texted us this. I just wanted to make sure we put that out there because while we're recording, the Bruins did make some recalls. And some of this has this to do with – 
the fact this that Providence... Most, this is most importantly how the Bruins are going to turn the series around. Okay, yeah, this is really important for that. Um, when I read these, you're going to know why. Um, and so Providence season ended. Their playoff season ended. So um, not super surprising that at this time they're making more call-ups. But um, So they announced the roster transactions today. Uh, recalling forward Patrick Brown, Jason Megna, and goaltender Brandon Bussey from Providence. So um, those are the transactions. I mean, they're, Patrick Brown was already up at, at one point in the series. Listen, the, the facts are undeniable. Bruins with Patrick Brown in this series are 1-0. and 1-0. Oh. Oh. Bruins without Patrick Brown in this series are 0-3. Oh mm-hmm. I mean, here you go. Here's your turnaround. This is how the Bruins win three in a row. That's true. There you go. Patrick Brown. Maybe he's good luck. Who knows? Uh, but those are the call-ups. Um, probably just to add depth and, you know, when you go down to Florida, just in case you need extra bodies. Because the Bruins aren't particularly healthy in the forward position right now. We talked about Marshawn Heinen came back, played his first game, but um, in a while since the Toronto series. But, you know, is he 100%? I thought I, I thought he I thought he looked pretty I thought he good, looked good too. Way. I thought he looked good too. I mean, I've, obviously, you'd love for him to bury that breakaway, but yep. Nonetheless, like I, I thought he played well. Bridget, you know what's funny? Uh, you said you woke up this morning feeling more angry, and mm-hmm. you 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 were, you were angry at Paul Maurice. You're angry at the, the officiating in the league and all these I'm things. I'm just angry that I'm just angry that if this is something that like we're passionate about and that we invest a lot of time and like effort into breaking down and then we have to come on and, and, and talk about that shit instead. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I'm I mean, just angry. It just ruins, it, it ruins the fun. I mean, it, when Brad Marshan is in the lineup against this Panthers team, the Bruins are still very outmatched in my opinion. You entered that game last night without Marshan. It's a tough enough task to beat the Florida Panthers, you know, fair and square. It's, 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 t- it's even tougher when, when you have a call like that go against you. I, I get the frustration. I really do. But, you know, I'll be honest with you guys. I've been saying all year, we've all known this, okay? And, and, and we don't harp on it because it's still a season to play. Technically, you never know. And and it's no fun to watch sports and try to be like, oh, well, they're not going to win, so why, why bother? But we knew from the end of last year with their cap restraints, this Bruins team was going to have to make do with what they had. They were going to have to make chicken soup out of chicken shit for the most part. And, and, and that's what they've done. But their ceiling, in my opinion, was never probably any higher than the second round of the playoffs. And, and I'll be honest, I'm surprised they got to the second round of the playoffs. This team is what they are. It, it is what they are. They they have a couple core players in place, but it, it was it was a bridge year. And I don't want me to say this right now prematurely because there's still hockey to play. But I'm less upset right now with the 2023-2024 Boston Bruins. I wake up with more anger about the 2022-2023 Boston Bruins. And I hate to look back, but that's honestly how I felt this morning. I was like, those fuck, those those assholes last year had it all. They had it all, and that was their opportunity. Their, they, the sky was the limit. Because this year, they're losing to the Panthers because of a lack of talent. Last year, the Bruins had more talent than the Panthers. By far. And they still found a way to lose that series. So it's like, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. Uh, that's what I kind of woke up this morning. I, I woke up with anger towards last year's team even more so than this year's. I'll be honest. I'll be honest. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to rehash the past, but they can't beat the, this Panthers team because, look, people want retribution against Sam Bennett and Matthew Kachuk because it's like the best way to get retribution is on the scoreboard, and this team doesn't really have what it takes. Yes, they could have could have and should have won game four, but, you know, it, yeah. chances are it would have ended in six anyway. Yeah, I, like I didn't see anyone tweeting about, oh, I can't believe the Bruins haven't taken out Bennett yet when they're up 2 nothing in this game. Then they end up losing and you get it all of it after like, oh, they lost and they didn't even do anything to Bennett. And it's like, listen, like they took a couple kind of dumb after the whistle penalties in that game. Like it, it plays right into Florida's, you know, Pasenak gives Anton Lundell a jab after the whistle and by the way, the, the Panthers fans who are like, he did the same thing you're accusing Bennett of. Like, hilarious, guys. Like, if if you watch those two plays and think Pasenak's jab was as hard as 
Bennett's punch to Marshan's head. Like, come on. But wasn't regardless, wasn't a smart penalty to take. And then Pat Maroon goes over to Matthew Kachuk way after the whistle and almost like lazily just allows his stick to be up near Kachuk's head and it grazes him across the side of the head. Was it violent? Nope. Did it do any damage at all? Nope. Was it very foolish? Absolutely. I have no idea why his stick was up there. It like how about so, Morgan Geeky backing into Bobrovsky? Yeah, with nobody in the third period was. after you just killed a penalty. Like yeah. the stupidity of the again, I understand the Bennett goal shouldn't have counted according to the the, the law of the of the NHL, but but it, the officials didn't know that, but we know that. But again, the first Bruins goal against, like not a great goal, not a great time of the of the game to give up a goal. You're up two nothing. End of this towards the end of the second period, and then the go ahead goal for Barkov, <clears throat> Charlie McAvoy, who I thought had a really good, really good game. Obviously, had that great hit on Reinhardt to start and, and set the tone. But you know he's he he he's pinching there. He can't pinch there, and then you know Barkov has you know he got, there's like two or three Bruins sweaters around him. He just kind of cuts through all of them, makes a nice yeah. goal. That can't happen. Um, yeah, it was and then, Pasternak, and then, it was Pasternak, DeBrusque, and Frederick that are the three yeah. guys closest to him trying to make the – Pasternak was yeah. trying to st- slow him down, but he just slips right by. And, right, and which then, is like its own issue that it, it, it's the three forwards because, as Brian mentioned, McAvoy kind of right. chases a hit and he's caught out of position a bit. And then when you do give up the tying goal, you know, you go right back to the penalty box and then you give up the, you give up the go-ahead goal eventually – I mean, the Bruins had what eight eight minutes of penalties in the third period, like most of which you're trying to come back and tie the game. It's like that's just a, it's inexcusable. I mean the the Lind the Lindholm interference on Kachuk. It's like the puck was right. It was right around there. It's like those. I honestly that probably should have been let go. I'll be honest with you. And, and Kachuk kind of goes down like he was shot, and then he gets up two seconds later like he's fine. Obviously, either he's played kidding, but. I mean, Again. at least I got. At least I thought Lindholm got his money's worth. Like that—that that was a—that was a pretty hard hit. And, you know, obviously, like didn't knock Chuck out of the game or anything. But I think you know, shook shook him up a little. We we haven't, we haven't seen Lindholm do that well, a whole lot. Yeah, I, I I don't know if it actually really shook him up, but yeah, I mean, fair enough. He got he got his money's worth. But again, you're 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 down in the game and and you're going to the penalty box constantly against the power play that's twenty five percent against you. And then you finally do get a power play with like seven minutes left. And it's like, where those two minutes go, right? So we can be upset with the, with the calls. I get it, but guys, there's way too much hockey being played that that's, that's where I'm looking at. It's just, you know, it, it's yeah. I don't know. It, 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 they're where they are. Deservedly. So in my opinion, they've gotten vastly outplayed over the course of the first four games. So they, if you believe had, in karma, they should be down three to one. Yeah, they had four power plays, four forty-four of power play time. So they weren't all. One of them they scored on. They weren't all full. Um, yeah, but Pasta two, two, in the two first, shots like, on goal. Two shots on goal on those four power plays. None on that last one that you mentioned. They thirty-five yeah. seconds of six on four at the end. No shots on goal. Like, yeah. I, again, like that. That is maybe what's most baffling to me about how this game. From when Barkov scores to give the Pandas the lead, there is 12.29 left in the game, and the Bruins don't land another shot on goal. They can't push back. They can't They can't force their will on, on opposite. Guys, they could barely do it against Toronto. I, I was watching that Toronto Bruins game seven. I mean, it was a pretty evenly played game, but you could very, very well make the argument that the team up north that's blowing things up probably this summer. I know a playoffs is a it's a coulda shoulda woulda thing, but the the Maple Leafs easily could have won that series, and nobody would have been sitting there saying, "Oh wow, the Bruins lost a series. They shouldn't have, like like they." So this, this this dates back to Game Five against Toronto. They've just been getting out possessed, out shot, um, out played in a, in every facet. Yeah, no desperation. No no has Florida been on their heels at all? At all outside of, outside of game game one where they were shaking off the, the the cobwebs off their their uniforms, not really. Maybe for about like ten minutes in the third period of game three. Every the only time a Florida power play isn't in the offensive zone 
is if the puck's being dropped to center ice because they just scored. Like every Florida power play, it's it's like they're just passing it around like the Harlem Globetrotters. No, no pressure. No, no. Cl- How many field clear attempts do the Bruins have in a, on a penalty kill? So again, I I know what the storylines are after Game Four. I understand it, and there's validity to it. Okay, absolutely. But I'm gonna choose to look at the things that the Bruins can control and what they haven't done than I am what you can't control, which is the officials. Because guys, let's be honest. The officiating in the NHL has always been, will always be inconsistent and a mystery. The league has never once took, taken accountability. They never will. So I'm choosing to look at the other aspects of this series and in, in, in that game because that that that's the stuff that's within the Bruins' control. I agree with you, too. Like, I, I wasn't sure the Bruins deserved to win that first-round series against Toronto. Uh, game 7 went to overtime. And Postanok makes a great move and any any scores. And it's just a, a play that a little bit of luck, a little bit of skill, and the Bruins are on to the next round. Uh, same thing could have happened in the other direction for Toronto at some point in overtime if they ha- you know had a chance to finish. But um the Bruins are definitely have not looked like the better team in this series. They look like the better team first period. Um and, and you you mentioned the power play goal. That was Pasternak. It was only eight seconds in to the Bruins' power first power play, I think. Um, it was the second, but uh, it was very early. And so obviously they didn't have any other shots on that one because it was like a face-off win, slid over to Pasta, and he scores on a one-timer. So um, you, you were starting to see in the beginning parts of, of game four some progress right like it looked like you were not that the shots uh mm-hmm. quantity were, were high enough still but you saw some progress and even in the second period you're getting those breakaway chances and and debrusque that might be the most frustrating one debrusque throws it right through Bobrovsky's five hole and it comes out the other side and it's like he had him beat but the angle was it was wide of the, the net I, I, I thought coil coil had him beat too like he he had room up top and he just sailed it over the net um i actually i thought oddly enough like the goals don't reflect it but i i thought the bruins were better in the second period than the first i mean they get out shot 15 to 5 in the first i, I thought florida had better chances that period again how does that even happen though, scott even though they end up you know florida scores in the second but i actually i actually thought i thought the bruins had the better chances in the second how, by like i a know pretty decent margin i know they're up to nothing scott but like you're down two one in the series you're at home how do you come out in that first period and get out shot 15 to five or whatever you said it was? And I, I know they got the lead, but like still the, the shot total dictates like where the puck is for the most part. Like how, how, how does that happen? The Bruins haven't found like one period outside of game one where they're out shooting the Panthers by 10. And it's like, Oh wow, Boston, they turned it up that period. It's like, it's either break even or it's all Florida. It, that's what it seems like. And it's very much oftentimes all Florida. Yeah, I mean, the overarching thing I'll keep coming back to is Florida is just a better team. Like, I know that I know that's frustrating because we want to be able to say the Bruins can do this and that and and should do this and that and change this in order to to be better. Like, at some point over the course of a series, the the better team's just gonna have more possession, more shots, more goals, and more wins. And that feels like the way this series is headed for me. And that's that's simplistic, and that it's not to say that there aren't things that the Bruins can change and do better because there obviously are. And I don't want to make you know I don't want to give them the excuse of like, oh well, they just don't have the roster to do it. But like that is kind of, you you said it earlier like that is kind of just what we thought all year. It's like yeah, I think we all know like this just isn't a Stanley Cup I mean, roster. It and is. You're kind of yeah. you're kind of you're seeing that now. You you are, but I still think like. Based on effort alone, no matter how much better a team is than you, based on pu- if you just go 20 minutes of a period, just pure pure effort, like no talent, you should still be able to get one period in the series where like you just kind of like control the whole period. Just just based on effort alone and the fact that they're all NHLers. You know what I mean? Like, yes, Florida's yeah. the better team all over the ice. I get it. But like one period, one 20 minute frame, you can't just blitz them. And that hasn't happened. And and that's not just because Florida's better. I, I mean, I don't know what it is. I, I think I think a lot of it's probably game plan too. But man, you know what it is? 
black seats. They gotta get the yellow seats back at the garden. No more home ice advantage. What what are they now? So they're they're two and four at at TD Garden in the, in the playoffs this year. And entering the playoffs this year, they were already like below five hundred in the last eighteen nineteen games there. Right? Yeah. Two and two against Toronto. Two uh, zero and two against Florida. So there you go. There's a home ice advantage. Um. All right. We gotta go, huh? Yep. We gotta go. Yeah, we we should mention. So we we recorded this uh, Monday morning. Don Sweeney is talking at twelve twenty. Um, I I know people think he's he's gonna just like rip into the league. I I don't really expect that. But you know, if there is something crazy that comes out of that, um, we might throw up like a, a short bonus podcast when when we get a chance to uh, regroup and, and discuss. But if, if you're wondering, if you're listening to this later in the day, that's why we didn't we didn't talk about anything, Don Sweeney. I also haven't even mentioned quickly, but you got I mean, the reason why the Bruins are losing like this, right? And why they're losing home the way that they are. You guys know the actual reason, right? I can't wait to hear what, what your what your thoughts are. The centennial uniforms. Oh, uh, okay. yes. I should have seen that one. Should have seen even, that coming. We, it's not the Bruins out there. It's called. It's it's. Called, thank you. It's been a while. <laughs> Since the fashion segment, it it's not the Bruins versus the Panthers. It's Colorado State Club Hockey versus the Panthers. That's what it is. There's there's no re- no resemblance of the Boston Bruins out there at all. Get that? That's the biggest positive to this season ending, possibly in Game Five. Get those Centennial glitter gold uniforms out of my face and bring back the yellow that they wore for 99 years. And that that will bring the cup back to Boston. Not this Centennial gold glitter nonsense. Hell out of here. My God, I feel like I'm. Lo- Whatever. <laughs> All right, that's good. That's it for this episode. Let's <laughs> let's let's end it. Ser- series not over. Season not over. Um, but for things to continue, the Bruins have to pretty much do uh, carry the one. Yeah, just about everything differently. So um, hope for a better result in Game Five down in Florida. Thank you all for listening, and we will talk to you on Wednesday. Hey guys, thanks for watching the Skate Podcast. If you want to see more of our videos, visit our playlist. Not in front of a screen? You can listen to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to follow us on social media. And if you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give us a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel, and leave a comment.